Ungwan Ke. Καλησπέρα σε όλους. Καλώς ήρθατε πάλι στη δεύτερη παρουσίαση που έχουμε. Σήμερα θα μας μιλήσει η Pat Kaufman. Είναι, όπως είχαμε πει και την περασμένη εβδομάδα, η Pat είχε την έμπνευση για αυτή τη σειρά και έχει και την επιμέλεια. Την περασμένη φορά είχαμε τρεις αξιόλογους καλλιτέχνες. Σήμερα η ΠΑΤ θα κάνει τη δική της παρουσίαση, γιατί έτσι πρέπει να κάνει. Έχει πολύ ωραίο έργο να μας δείξει. Και σε δύο λεπτά θα σας παραδώσω το μικρόφωνο στην ΠΑΤ. So good evening everyone. For those of you um, who are here for the first time, this is the second in a series of presentations uh, that Uh, have been basically organized by Pat Kaufman, who is a, a, a member of ours and has actually undertaken uh, this series of presentation. But since she herself is a very well-known artist, uh, it is only fitting that she has her own presentation tonight. So basically that's it. Thank you all for coming. If you have any questions at the end of the, uh, of the session, You can either tap in a question or raise your hand and there'll be a question answer uh, session at the end of, uh, end of the presentation. So welcome to everyone. We hope you enjoy it. And there will be many, many more of these uh, in the next three or four months. So Pat, over to you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Dean, first I have to ask your help. On the right-hand side of my screen, Uh, screen, I'm getting the entire chat page. How do I get rid of it? I can't see any bar. You should see, you should see an X uh, button to where the chats are to the participants. No. Uh, top right corner. No. If not, uh, click participants or click chat. Click chat. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I'm Pat Kaufman, as I've already been introduced by Helen. Um, I'm an artist who's been living, uh, I've been coming to Kithira for the, well, since 1980 was my first time. And 1985, I moved from New York City to uh, London. Uh, in, in New York, I, was, I always thought of myself as a painter and I didn't do that much work and I was never very happy painting because I had actually nothing to say. It just wasn't me. I love the material. I love the pigments. I used to make my own pigments. And in the etching studio that I, that I owned, I used to make my own pigments for the artists that I worked with. And I used to make my own grounds for the plates. So I had a facility with materials and hands, but I always thought that I was a painter until I moved to London. And then there, there was no light. And so I did what many Uh, most Americans do. Uh, I put myself back into school and just started, just decided to start all over again. And lo and behold, within two months, I was uh, a completely changed person because I was no longer an unhappy painter. I was somebody who used my hands and made three-dimensional work. And I'm going to turn over now to my, uh, to the, Oops, hold on, not to zoom. To the presentation. Hmm. What you're seeing now should be seeing slide. There we go. Okay, now I can no longer see you. In fact, Dean, I can't see you or anybody else except for my uh, PowerPoint presentation? No, unfortunately, I can't see the PowerPoint presentation either. Have you shared the screen correctly? Hold on. No. Let me press escape. Oh, yeah. I forgot to press share. Sorry, these are the teething problems, I'm afraid. Screen share, here we go. That's okay. We did practice this, only I forgot, I'm nervous. That's okay. Have you got it now? No, you have to share got the it. screen. 
There we go. There you are. Perfect. All right. There we go. Wonderful. Okay. What I'm starting you off with, with are the first pieces based, um, influenced by Keithra or by Greece in general. And my first, my first three-dimensional piece was to take a cast from a Byzantine roof tile made out of clay and transpose it into bronze. And what I loved about these was that the makers of them, they were completely handcrafted. And then uh, the artist, the maker of these, these things would draw on them. And every tile, every Byzantine roof tile has a different drawing. And these would go on top of the roofs of churches and nobody would ever see them. So there's hidden artwork all over, all over Greece. And by putting it in, casting it in bronze, I've immortalized it, I believe. My second uh, two-dimensional piece was to take 42 sand casts of both sides of a uh, stone here, uh, the uh, slate that I found on uh, quite close by a church, a church that had uh, ceramic tile top, but I believe at one point must have had a slate roof because this is, would have made a perfect tile. And I cast that both sides of it uh, because it reminded me of both a human torso and of a heraldic shield. And this is quite a large piece. It uh, reaches about uh, two and a half meters high by two and a half meters in width as well. All the casts are individually placed, so it's not all welded together. And hold on. And the, okay. Here's uh, another place piece based on Keithra um, that expresses my horror and then recovery from my first from the first forest fire that I that I became acquainted with. Uh, I, the burning in the summertime was just horrific. And on the bottom rank is, is our three plaques made out of um, containers holding black earth, burnt earth, ash, forest fire ash from quite close by here in Stropodi and graphite. And that symbolizes the colors of the scorched earth. Whereas above, and I actually made the pieces above a year later when I saw for the first time how there would be a resurgence of life. And what we have on the above are terra verde, Indian red and Mars yellow. All, and this to me represents uh, kind of the afterlife of things on, on uh, after, de after uh, desolation. Uh, my problem when I changed from painting to sculpture was, as I said, as a painter, I had nothing to say and I wasn't particularly interested in the content of paintings. But I came across this portable altarpiece at the National Gallery by Duccio. And I was bowled over. First, it was very, very beautiful. The painting was gorgeous. However, what really hit me were the proportions and the shape. And I, for the first time, I realized that shape and proportion, even devoid of color, could have an emotional impact. And so I started working and trying to play around with the idea of how I could hold color and shape together and how I could use color in sculpture without having to artificially apply it. And I started thinking about all those ecclesiastical uh, practices and I came across reliquaries. And then all of a sudden I realized that color could be used as a reliquary. And here I, are my first so-called reliquaries. Here we have a, a cabinet made out of stainless steel with wings of stainless steel that open and close. So whoever owns it can, can play with the, um, with the object. So it's constantly changing. A highly polished stainless steel. And inside is contained at least five kilos of, of pigment, five kilos in this one of pigment compressed like a powder compress. So you have nothing but pure material and pure color. 
And here is ultramarine. And I think this has seven kilos, it might be five. I think it has six or seven kilos also compressed into the same, um, the same dimensions. And the dimensions are 85 by 95 by six uh, centimeters. So they're quite large. From there, I went on just as I said, the emotional shape. So I'll kind of run through these very quickly because I have lots of slides. These are the exact proportions of the Duccio altarpiece. Nickel-faced steel on one side next to ebonized wood. So you have that the shiny, reflective, slightly yellow color of nickel against a very, very dark, deep burnished ebony color. Here going along with that is a piece I call Civitas. It's also taken from a, a tri, uh, triptych in the National Gallery, which had been cut, da back, cut down by the Victorians according to what they thought Gothic art should look like. And I always found that shape very, very comic and rather um, stern at the same time. So I decided to take that sternness and transform it into a softer, more friendly material. And here we have American cherry wood planks, not veneer, the actual planks. Because my thinking on this is when I made it, when you hand burnish it, which is what I do with my pieces and with what they do often in uh, church, with church altars, that is polished by hand, it acquires a sheen. And then as it's polished over time, 500 years is a good, is a good amount. Uh, it acquires a patina, sheen and gloss and a depth of color because of the oxidation and the change of color in the wood. So 500 years from the time I made it, it's going to be a real something special. And at the moment it is quite special and the total height of it is uh, two meters 10 by one meter 20 each piece. Uh, let's see if I can go on now. Again, a potted history of art. To the left is poplar wood, which is what the early icons were made. Uh, to the right is burnished nickel faced steel representing uh, sort of the industrial age. And in the middle uh, is an aluminum box holding any number of layers of glass until they become a mirror. Uh, and that's the contemporary. The, I don't say how many layers of glass are in there because really uh, it's better to have it remain a mystery. This is a more contemporary idiom. Uh, this is with the idea of a 1950s wall unit, like a cocktail shaker cabinet. Um, again, this is a piece made so that people, whoever owns it can open or close and, and uh, open and close it. So the artwork changes. This is a later piece made from the Azores when I had a residency there. And this is, again, I, I usually, I go back to the same motifs. This is black volcanic sand uh, adjacent to, a vol to layers of glass uh, so that the dark glass until the glass appears black like obsidian. The piece of the, this piece is called obsidian. And it's based on the fact that uh, fused, fused sand makes glass and fused sand also makes obsidian. Again, the idea of using color naturally uh, is something I was still concerned with. This again is the Azores and had to do with the quiet and the silence of being in the middle of the ocean. There was no ambient sound whatsoever. There were no insects. Um, there were very few birds. So sound was something. Um, this is called day to night. And these are layers of glass that form the colors. On the top, various layers of glass to form the intensity of color. And on the bottom, again, like obsidian, layers of black glass or different colors of dark grays and browns to form a deep black. And you can see in the distance there is a piece called Horizon, which again are using color colored glass in lieu of pigment. 
now we come to my first installations, early installations. My first installation was to make 500 perfect, absolutely perfect plaster cast houses that you could hold in your hand. Um, they're about this size, three and a half inches, I think, three and a half inches by about four, rather comfortable to hold. I made a pyramid of 500 of them and the sculpture was complete when every single one of them had been taken away by the public. My only caveat to the public was that they could take only one piece at a time. So in effect, this is a rather nasty thing because it tested people's integrity and either proved they had integrity or it didn't. So it proved both a kind of incipient nastiness possibly of human beings or human nature and of me, the artist for putting people to this test. Um, because I'm American and North American and I had it happen to admit that I knew how to make igloos, I was invited to be team leader uh, to, a, to the British team, none of us were British, to the British team uh, in, uh, in Moscow, in Gorky Park, to their annual snow and ice festival. And we were given three meter by three meter boxes of compressed snow. However, they had a freak cold wave then, and it was 35 degrees below zero. And the ice, the uh, snow compacted into incredibly hard ice. And whereas I had come expecting to deal with American, American style soft snow, this was really rock hard. And we had to use axes and saws and blow torches. And we had only a short time of time to devise what we were going to do. And in the end, it was so difficult that we decided to make just a, a large human form going north south with a smaller human form going east west and they intersected in the middle. And people could, could climb through, hold on, I'm trying to find my cursor here, there we go. So people could climb through, children loved it. Children could go through it easily, but as you can see, some people couldn't. Uh, and the, um, the judges of the contest hated us because we, we just did a, a completely contemporary cube, uh, cube, but it was voted by the people as one of the most popular uh, sculptures that year, which was really terrific. We had a lot of fun. Then I was asked, uh, my first commission is where we are now. And I had never worked with stone and I was asked to do a piece. They thought I would be good for making a, a, an outdoor wall piece. They had seen the, the um, city, the aluminum plaques for Hackney Community College, which was being built at the time I was asked. Actually 12 artists were asked to do, to commission public work uh, to site in the college and I was given a niche to look at and instead of doing a wall piece I thought it'd be more interesting to do to stone and I had seen this piece in the Keramikos in outside of Athens and I fell in love with 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 the it's an architectural element that they've just put together and I thought it would be it stay had stayed in my mind sorry I'm going to the Cursor, there we are. And uh, you can see the wall behind that they had intended that I would probably do a, a, a piece on, but you can see that actually the courtyard is more interesting. So I devised two, uh, two stone pieces. I actually did the finishing on this myself. Um, this is Portland stone. They stand about 120 centimeters high it's made so that students can lean against it and use their notebooks. In those days, they still had notebooks. The seating is uh, quite high, about 90 centimeters. So in order to sit on it, they have to hoik themselves up. Uh, and it's, it's, there's, the seats are set close together. So the knees, so the knees, if you're sitting upward are quite close. So it forms a very tight enclosed space to play with. 
and it has aged, uh, it's not quite as, as raw and white. Had I known more about stone, I would not have used Portland because Portland stone can be very, very dead, but I didn't know that at the time. On the basis of this seating, I was invited to do a sculpture. If you look at the slide on the lower, on the lower left, and you see, if you can see the blue gate that's there, they were hoping to have a sculpture made inside. What this is, is a power station below the London Docklands Light Railway. So up above trains run, run, and this is a power station. So it has to be closed off. There's a hell of a lot of electricity in there. But again, it didn't seem very appropriate to do a uh, sculpture because nobody would see it and it would get quite dirty. So we talked about it and, and I suggested that we do a light piece because I'd been interested in, in doing light. Inside that substation was a Victorian arch. So inside the arch, which was blocked off, I painted it white and I flooded it with a blue dichroic filter. Then be in the substation uh, uh, up above and hidden, I hung a numbers of springs, industrial springs, um, and, and uh, through the, sh the th shadows of the springs against the, uh, the back wall, so that when the trains passed overhead, the springs would move up and down. And what we had was a kind of perpetual motion machine and a ersatz film e effect. Okay, and the forecourt, I wanted everything very contained because it was a very sad area. Lehman Street is a very depri deprived area. So what I did is I painted the ceiling a, a, a deep yellow. I added yellow sodium lights, yellow street, the old fashioned yellow street lights because that forms a contained glow and is a very warm color. And the pillars were glazed with, were painted white underneath and then glazed with 13 la layers of, of hand applied glazes, knowing that the light would bounce through the pillars back to the white base and back through so that it, it creates its own sense of illumination. So the pillars looked like they were illuminated from the inside. And meanwhile, I had been asked um, for the A13 Artscape project. Uh, there were numbers of artists along the new A13, which they were transforming from a, a six lane highway to a 10 lane highway. Sorry, from a three lane highway. No, no, I was right, to a 10 lane highway. And I was asked to decorate a pedestrian subway. But if you go back and you look at that desolate area, um, I did make a proposal. I proposed that they take the 200,000 uh, pound project money, they put it in the bank and on the interest that they should hire a tea lady to dispense uh, tea and security um, because really decoration didn't mean anything. And then we all had a good joke about it. And they said, well, what would you do? And I said, well, I propose that we change the environment and create parks on two sides. Well, they had already thought about that about three or four years previously. So they revived that idea and they asked me to come up with a proposal. And because I'm based on Keithera and I know all about the tensile strength of terraces, I propose that we create terrace, uh, terraces, uh, landscape terraces uh, that would make it easier for pedestrians uh, to gain access and, it, and they could be planted. So that was accepted. And two years later, the money was given by the EU and work started. And in the tunnel, I, there were three parts to the project. In the tunnel, I decided to uh, reference uh, underground stations, Art Deco underground stations in London. So I gave it a very jazzy, uh, jazzy kind of uh, Art Deco theme. 
and I created niche artworks, windows, holding artworks referencing the history. I'm gonna do that. Uh, these are niche artworks that reference the history of the locations. And these were images silk screened on mirror covered with colored, poly, poly, colored uh, resins with LED lighting uh, embedded on the inside. My reasoning at that point was that the vandals and the, and the people around, the kids around that area were real vandals. Uh, they would be reluctant to pry out uh, these images if they thought they might be electrocuted. So what we, we created these and uh, put them in stainless steel frames covered with a poly, uh, polycarbonate coating um, glass, a poly, polycarbonate sheet that, could, that would take about 45 minutes to break through if they so wanted to do. And in the end, we, this was the effect in, inside the tunnel, tunnels. So that was one part. Then uh, this part came and was transformed into a 180 meter park going in all directions with planting, with uh, faux Roman arches here because this had once been the site uh, of a Roman garrison. In fact, uh, the movie theater, the local movie theater was built over the Ro Roman garrison. Um, so I resurrected uh, reference to that. And I'm, it, was just, it made it a very nice safe area and a pleasant area I thought to come in. And I did, of course, I kept thinking of Keithra, this created a microclimate and my first planting scheme involved fig trees and grapevines and everything that you find on Keithra was planted here one day and within two days had disappeared into the housing projects nearby. We tried it again, disappeared again within two days. So in the end, I ended up having to plant just grasses. Uh, because nobody was interested in plucking those up. But this is the end result was a sunken garden and then a raised platform a bit up above for pedestrians and bicycles. Uh, around that time also, I was invited to Art Esles in Santander, Spain and artists which able to choose sites. And by this time I was really interested in light and what could happen. And I decided to create a drawing in space by using UV, uh, UV sensitive line uh, lit by UV fluorescent tubing. And this is the result. By day I took, I, I, put these thousands of lines and uh, in the back, uh, in the window in the back of this barn, attached it to the opening. And this was the effect. And I loved it because it was, it was truly, a, a, this is an undoctored photograph of what it appeared like at night, just pure lines of light. And that's just using a natural material in a way that you don't expect. I mean, I'm always, I'm always gobsmacked by the nature of materials and what, what happens to them if you do something unexpected. So I continued that again, this was for the European Union uh, Commission in London, an exhibition. And then I was lucky enough to be uh, asked to do a proposal for Imperial College's newly built uh, uh, physical um, sports center. And this gave me an opportunity to again use light in a different way. And I uh, decided that I was going to use vectors and sine waves. And I collaborated with a biodynamics lab at Imperial College. And what you see here is a bicycle, bicycle velocity pattern. And up above it are the various sine waves of brain muscle reaction time of of athletes um, that they were testing at the biodynamics lab. And I translated that into, there was a 130 meter 
glass balustrade fronting fronting this building. So I use that to create to create a dual nature uh, piece. One, a gold leaf sine wave, and it was actual gold leaf. Let me get my, having trouble finding my cursor. Oop. You can use your left and right arrow keys. No, but... they disappear sometimes, there's a trouble. <laughs> anyway, here we go. When I talk about uh, dual nature, the, let's see if we can go and show, you'll see here, on the right hand side, I have, it is pure gold. It is real gold leaf. A, it was cheaper than using gold paint. And B, it was a natural element. So we have natural elements here. Glass, uh, a, an, etched, etched, an etched erratic sine wave, which is an amateur rower. So uh, the amateur rower is be, be behind the uh, professional rower's sine wave. Professional rowers were all the same. They were all extremely boring. So I had to use an amateur rower. And what we've got here, this whole thing, the, the 134 meters is a portrait of two people. One is the professional rower and one is the uh, portrait of various brain muscle reaction times to various parts of the body of an amateur. So by night, you have the, uh, the lines light up and they look like pure, pure light. And the amateur rower comes to the foreground. And by day, the amateur rower recedes to the background and the gold leaf comes to the foreground. And the main gold leaf, as you walk along it, it seems to undulate, it seems to move. Uh, so here we go again, there we go. Again, using the same thing. I can't. I this is this is the last drawing with line uh, with UV sensitive line. But this was in Germany in Artol a few years ago, and again showing how how simple lines and UV light can change uh, 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 can change. And, and I'm not here. Instead of using uh, lines of light, I used photosensitive. Uh, pigment. I painted it with a photosensitive uh, paint, which looked white by daylight and changed into a luminous blue by night, again with a, using a UV bulb. And to continue, this is work that I'm continuing now. Uh, this is called uh, After Uccello. And these are hearts, hares, and hounds, hearts being deer, um, hares and hounds. Uh, and again, the ubiquitous pure gold. And I'm gonna go quickly through one of my real preoccupations, which I love is the idea of seeding and placement, placement of bodies and people in, in the environment, what it means to be sitting and how you feel there and also how it feels to be looked at from a distance. And you'll see here uh, that I often use drawings um, this is called All I Survey. If you sit here, your feet, your feet, I should have a cursor, Dean, you're right. Your feet would be dangling. Your hands, your arms would be, be resting on the hand rest. Your shoulders would be slightly up, but you'd feel very comfortable. All my seating is made to be extremely comfortable. But you'd look a little bit funny with your feet dangling and your head up and your shoulders hunched. So you would feel as though you were All I Survey. But if you're surveyed from a distance, you might not look that regal. This was a large bench uh, for a project that was stopped um, because they hadn't done their tax paperwork properly. And this was a large bench that was supposed to be sit in, set into a riverbank with a bicycle path behind it and it would have been uh, a nearly three meter long bench for fishermen along the river, river Neen to sit on the bottom and, and uh, cast the reel, while up above there would be pedestrians that could sit on the top of the, uh, of the bench. And here you see, sometimes I can't do the maths, so I have to do a drawing in, uh, to scale. This is not to scale, this is real life. This is a real life scale. These are how I would like these, uh, 
these thrones or chairs to be made. To the left is cleft throne, to the right is stepped throne. And here are the various maquettes. Uh, the drawing, I had tried the, to make, um, a, I commissioned a small stone sculpture based on the clay piece that's to the left, but I realized my proportions were all therefore I had to do a drawing to size to be able to get the proportions right, which is what the middle, the middle sculpture is. And this is a Lancaster stone, which is a nice warm uh, pinkish stone that takes it that takes a uh, takes a nice surface. And this is called cleft uh, cleft throne, where you wouldn't exactly sit completely in the front, but you might, you might scoot back into the back and just sit there and hug your knees, you'd be completely hidden. And this is the final part of my talk is the works that have done been done actually on Keithra for Keithra. And this was part of a group of us women artists, we joined together Keithriskus and we took the old school in Potamos, and I call this the old schoolhouse. There was a cupboard set into the walls, and I put in, I flooded it with a dichroic filter. And what you couldn't hear was, what you couldn't see was a, uh, a recording device with the sounds of children laughing, laughing. And those I had, I had uh, Panayotis Lefteres, who's here from the island, had helped me uh, comp a sound piece from the sounds of the children's playgrounds here on Keithra. So you couldn't hear it, but you, uh, you couldn't see it, but you would hear the voice and that's what that young boy is looking for. He's trying to find out where the voices are coming from. This is called the God Catcher, and it's, it was, I made it here, but it was for a show in Athens called Prome, um, Prome, uh, Theophagos, Theophagos, sorry, um, Eating of the Gods. And my piece has to do with Prometheus bringing fire to human beings uh, in the reed of a, in a reed. And this is, of course, you recognize a Fanari. Again, this was a group show at Follow Your Art in Capsali. And this is called Domestic Archaeologies. And we have here uh, three items, four items recovered from the dump, Ikithra, when we could go to the dump. And there are two dresses circa uh, 1920s and uh, on a handmade hanger, I guess you would call it, uh, again found at the dump. And all these archaeologies were set. That's why I call it domestic archaeologies. All these were thrown away. They're not valued on Keithra. I couldn't believe it. And the, uh, this is untitled, but what it is, is lace, handmade lace on the left. On the right is an, an impression of lace, only the impression is made out of a forest fire ash. And it's about the sadness, the, the loss. And this small finari is called lace cage because again, I took, I took lace and I have entwined it into the Fanari. You cannot open the Fanari now. It is there forever embedded. Uh... And here, this was done back in 2007. You recognize the methodology. So I'll just go through it. What I love about UV light is it really is revealing. If you look to the left, and you see that girl's skirt, the, uh, the UV light made her skirt transparent. So there she is exposed. And she's probably the only woman I've seen wearing garters since the 1960s. And here we are at dusk uh, looking out to Kapsali. And here we are in full darkness uh, looking up with a castro.
And we'll close with the two commissions uh, on Keithra for stonework, stone seeding. I was in Iman in, uh, on a residency in 2008, and I fell in love with this architectural feature and had been thinking and longing for a place to make, so to make something of it at some point. And I was commissioned to, uh, by Costa, uh, Costa Pilavaki for his, uh, his land here on Kithra to make a piece. And I thought it was an absolutely perfect. I knew exactly where I wanted it to go, where the perfect site for it was, and everything with this project worked like magic. Here we are, this is a 15 ton piece of stone. When they finished carving it, that came down to seven tons and it's on another block that started off at 11 tons and ended up being four tons. And here we are carving this in uh, outside of Athens in a quarry. Uh, the stone came from Halkidiki no, yes, the stone came from Halkidiki and was transferred down. It took a week to cut uh, the stone because it was so hard. Uh, and this is Mirren, who is the uh, one of two uh, stonemasons. And here it is being transported to Kithra. And here we are placing it in, uh, in situ in Kithra, which turned out to be just a joy. It was just so easy. Everything just worked absolutely perfectly. And it turned out that this site that I had in mind from the very beginning turned out to be the only place, the only place that we could set it on, on, on this land because it was the only place that had firm enough ground. So it really was serendipity. And here is the finished piece. Here it is in, the, in its setting. And here is the rear view. As you can see uh, in the distance, you can see uh, the, uh, uh, the Avgo. And here it is in use. And from this, uh, these are called the twins and they're on our property. I have to say, I commissioned myself. I piggybacked on the, uh, on the, on the Grove Throne piece. And this is Syrian marble that has a, holds a lot of uh, limestone. And these shape, this is something I had devised a long time ago for uh, the throne for King Charles I of England uh, for a project in Newark where he spent his last night before he was uh, beheaded. And it was formed as an elegiac uh, shape and throne meant to be set on and uh, in a kind of thoughtful way. And you can see the, uh, the early Greek influences in this. And here it is in winter. And here we are as it's being used and it's not such a sad and elegiac piece after all. It's quite a cheerful one. And with that, we're done. There we are. I hope I have. I hope I haven't taken too long. I didn't time it. No, that's perfect. Okay, Dean, you can unmute people if you want. I'm feeling quite want, lonely. Do you want to unmute Helen, or do you want to unmute everyone? Ever unmute everyone. Okay, one second. Can I just say, while everyone is being unmuted, I've known you, Pat, for many years now, but I hadn't realized the extent of your talent, to be perfectly honest. I had seen the thrones and I had seen a couple of things, but I'm just I'm flabbergasted at what you managed to create. And, and can I say, I, I, I was really impressed by the subways. Maybe we should do something like that in <laughs> Athens. Every subway should look like your subway. Oh, but Helen, the subways in Athens are wonderful. They all have artwork. They are fabulous. 
Well, I've seen some that I wouldn't call exactly artwork, but anyway, <laughs> just a suggestion. <laughs> Okay, um, uh, so feel free, any, anyone who wants to um, uh, ask a question, uh, go ahead. Um, I'm sort of seventh of the order. Vic, Vic, okay, I see Vic. Congratulations, Pat. That was um, uh, well presented and uh, we had an insight into uh, your talents. Uh, I suppose for, art, uh, for subways, we can on Kithara use the arches of the Livadi Bridge. Um, oh. <laughs> yes. I'm sure you could brighten those up. Um, but I did want to see, think a little bit into the future. There's going to be um, some uh, competition or call for artists of the, for this um, statue in Ayipala here, uh, depicting the migration from the island um, years and years ago. Um, uh, generally, and don't quote me on this, but I think it's something in the form of a, um, a mother saying goodbye to her child. Uh, so I think that could be um, something we could look for in the future or, or maybe get some ideas from you um, uh, about how that could be presented. Thank you. Yeah, I think it would be very interesting to have work made uh, about the migration. I think it's, well, it would go along with the museum for sure. Mm. It, it is a separate project in a oh, sense, but connected um, through the, the, the theme of migration. We would like a common theme to go through the museum building and the and the statue. I think that would be ideal, basically. Collaboration is. I have always loved loved collaborating with architects and engineers and architect. Uh, every there's a synergy. Something always unexpected and good happens. Well, usually. I haven't had anything bad happen. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Always, cooperation is the best way of, uh, of having a good end result, I think. Mm. Is there anyone else who would like to ask Pat something? I was curious where that bench is in Kithida that you made. You know, the really big cement bench that was brought over and you said there was only one place it could be? Oh, that wasn't cement. That is how the design is grown. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that cement. That was a lot of carving. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's on. Uh, that's outside of Stropoli, facing uh, facing Hora, on the way to Aia Kindini. Could it's I ask Pat? Plan. When you do, uh, did stone masons do the chiseling for you, or did you actually also sort of? Um, work on, on I had expected to do the chiseling but because of the limestone has bits of iron in it it was so hard that the main the master uh, mason actually did his back out and we had to get somebody else to finish it I tried and I, I tried and I it would have taken me a thousand years yeah. Yeah, I, I think it would be rather difficult. Chisel, chisel, chisel. Right. I had originally planned to do the finishing myself. Mm -hmm. The twins are amazing. And I think they're, they really stood out for me. It reminded me of something south of Dublin here in Ireland, um, something similar, but not quite as nice as yours. But they're affectionately known here as the Wellington boots. <laughs> 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 or the wellies, as they call them. But uh, that, that, that's really nice. That's on your property, Pat, is that right? Yes, it is. And that and you are welcome to come and see that. Oh, I'll be, I'll right. be there. <laughs> in fact, I should say that if anybody's interested, those are, they are in an edition and that's only two out of the edition. The, the, oh. uh, they can be, com uh, another six can be commissioned. So that'll, I'll tout that out there. <laughs> but not from the same stone. That was Syrian limestone, and the story behind that is really sad because it was the last uh, bit that they got out of the quarry before they had to shut the quarry down because of the Syrian war. 
and the uh, stonemasons in Athens were instrumental in getting the owners of the of the Syrian quarry out of Syria. So that's so now. It, I mean, there's a it, it, it's there they are. They're they're facing Libya. They're facing the Middle East. Um, so Margaret Chu, will we meet there for a coffee in due course? <laughs> Absolutely, that'd be great. Okay. The two Irish uh, representatives here. Huh? <laughs> Pat, what exactly is dichroic color or light? It's light that's put through a prism and it bends color. So what happens with a blue, it'll turn to its opposite, which comes out to be a pink. So it has a range of color and, uh, and right. it I mean, I thought what you were doing with light is fabulous in those different places, both in Kithira and and in uh, elsewhere. And, and uh, it, it's wonderful the effects that you've created. And um, you know, I, I I reckon it's probably a fairly cost-effective kind of art, in as much as it's not expensive, and you get a lot of bang for your buck. So you know, it's, it it has a wonderful effect and can transform a place. You can transform a place, un but my feeling now is that it's uh, lights is overused, and also I can no longer make yeah. those line pieces because they don't the, the manufacturer no longer exists. Um, but I, I, um, I in yeah. fact, Costa Pilavaki had asked me to do a light piece instead of, and I said no, I'd prefer to do. If, would you let me do stone instead? Because I don't think Keithra is really an appropriate place for light light works. In fact, I would campaign to douse lights because it's so bad for, for nature. <laughs> it's such a waste of energy. You know. I know. So, yeah. No, but uh, I mean, just what you've done with the light, I think the effects were wonderful. I, thank I you, been, Nigel. Uh, thank you. Really lovely. Mm. Uh, can I ask the first two pieces that you showed her, the first few um, the the bronze mm. roof tile, and then you had that fabulous silver shield. Yes. And then the piece with the obsidian. Do you still do things like that, or? Oh yes. Left... <laughs> yeah. I do when when not here. <laughs> not here, of course. Yeah. No. But they're absolutely gorgeous. Really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. No, I do. Those are still. I still have those. Those are all in London. Oh, okay. And are I you going to, to bring them to Kithara? Uh, probably not. No, you have to leave. I, them. I, I, there's where would I put them? Some of my work will come to Kithara uh, for our house, but uh, no, it's, it's got to be where it can be uh, uh, accessed by clients. Mm. Any more questions? Anyone has any more questions? Uh, Pat Mortain seems to have a question, but she's muted or self-muted. Yes, no. If anyone wants to unmute themselves, they have the ability to now. Okay, I, I thank you because I loved it, but my English is not so good. I would like to see it again and because I want to understand everything, uh, is it possible to, uh, to see it online? Uh, we are in the, in the process of putting subtitles for uh, non-English speakers uh, onto our YouTube channel. Uh, it's proving a little more difficult than, uh, than first thought, uh, but hopefully we will uh, be able to be publishing videos uh, very soon. The channel is available. Uh, should anyone want the link to subscribe, uh, I can provide it in the chat very soon. Uh, but as of now, there are no videos on the channel, but you are more than welcome to subscribe. Yeah, but uh, I, would, I would like, uh, my question was, sorry, my question was, can I see it again, even in English? Yes, yes. Uh, once, when? once we're able to publish, once we're able to publish videos, we'll be able to do that. Uh, okay, and when? Oh, Bientôt. Uh, 
You will have to ask Helen. <laughs> <laughs> we will inform. I have to ask Ellen. Ellen? <laughs> okay, I will ask you. <laughs> we will inform uh, our members and we'll inform basically our Facebook page uh, well, when the uh, YouTube channel is actually up and running, which we hope will be soon. But as Dean said, we had more problems than we anticipated in getting some of the, tra the translations. Um, and, and actually, which brings me to another point. I have to apologize to Greek speakers tonight because all the presentation is in English, uh, but this is subject to the speaker. Uh, if they're more comfortable in the English language, they will make the presentation in the English language. And in future, when we have a Greek speaker, it'll be in Greek, uh, which will make it, of course, more difficult for the uh, non-Greek speakers. I'll just say that in Greek too, uh, there are a few following. Αυτό που θέλω να τονίσω είναι πως οι ομιλητές θα μιλάνε με τη γλώσσα που είναι πιο εύκολα για τους ίδιους. Μέχρι στιγμής είχαμε αγγλικά, αλλά έχουμε μπροστά μας Έλληνες καλλιτέχνες που θα επιλέξουν να μιλήσουν στα ελληνικά. Αυτό είναι ένα από τα προβλήματα που αντιμετωπίζουμε, αλλά πιστεύουμε άμα έχουν και πολύ υλικό σε φωτογραφία, Φωτογραφία είναι ευχάριστη και η ομιλία είναι και στα αγγλικά. Αλλά στο YouTube channel θα προσπαθήσουμε να έχουμε το δουλεύει βασικά η Μαρία η Διακά και αυτό τώρα να έχουμε μετάφραση στα ελληνικά για για αυτά που είναι στα αγγλικά. Λοιπόν, αυτά αν έχουμε και άλλες ερωτήσεις ευχαριστώς να συνεχίσουμε. Any more questions? Yes. Yes, Pia. Um, thanks, Helen. Pat, that was fantastic. Um, Pat, do you know, is there much variation in the stone across Kithira and is it used in sculpture? Well, uh, the poros is unfortunately too porous to use as sculpture, but it, it, and, and it wears away quite easily. The rock here is not, you don't have anything really solid enough to use for uh, for sculpture here, um, alas. But I was going to say that next week we're expecting Franca Papandreou to speak and she will have the choice of doing it in English or Greek. I might lean on her to do it in Greek so we have a chance to, to test ourselves, but that's going to be up to her. And Franca is, uh, she's an artist, but most recently she's been working on a book with illustrations for um, the story of Odysseus and it's soon to be published. So we can look forward to her next week, uh, in two weeks time two. rather. Right, any other, any yes. more comments before we say yes, good night? <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Wonderful. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. And a terrific variety of things you've done. It's yeah, amazing. amazing. Really fantastic. Well done, Pat. Thank you. Thank you for, for this, Helen. And Dean, thanks for your help. Thank Where are you? And John, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice thank evening. Thank it was you. wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Susan. <laughs> Nigel. Vicky, Vicky in California. Hi, Vicky. Hey, Victor, how's it going? <laughs> Good, thank you. How's Tom and your and your latest?